we're going to welcome Niels today here from uh, Hugging Face. Niels, it's a, a pleasure that you are kicking off the AI Academy event today with your talk on chasing the wrong benchmarks in machine learning. So welcome Niels. He's research scientist there and former NLP uh, lab, so to speak, a postdoc from UKP at TU Darmstadt. And we're, I'm pretty excited to see your talk today. I, I love the topic and um, stage is yours. Yes, so great. Um, very happy to be here. Um, this is a rather uncommon topic for me to present. So usually I talk about semantic search. So at Hugging Face, I'm leading the semantic search neural search team, science team, where we investigate ways how we can do better search in text and in many modalities. Um, <clears throat> but today I want to talk about benchmarks, um, why they play a role in machine learning and what happens if you are chasing the wrong, wrong benchmarks. So if you're familiar with my research, I, um, I did a lot of work how to evaluate models. I did a lot of work how to create better benchmarks. And I also did a lot of work complaining about the state, how we do scientific, um, how we do our scientific um, progress, how, how we do the scientific process in our field. And to today, today's talk is more about um, benchmarks, why are they important? So why do we need benchmarks? Um, what can happen when we chase the wrong benchmarks? So in science, luckily, the downside is not so bad. But if you run a company, um, the losses you can get from chasing the wrong benchmark can be really significant. And I want to finish the talk with how can you do design better benchmarks. Um, the talk is not only relevant for science, or people working in machine learning research, but also in any data science team. So if you develop any product, any machine learning powered product, um, you need to have benchmarks to measure to measure your system. And this is then this is talk is also highly relevant for you. <clears throat> so first of all, why do we need benchmarks? Um, from our lecture in business administration, we know you can't improve what you don't measure. So any problem where we don't have a measure is extremely hard to tackle. So um, that's why unsupervised machine learning stalled for so many years, for decades, because you, know, you cannot measure it. So you cannot measure if you make progress. And the typical cycle in machine learning looks the following. So you have some task, you train your machine learning model on it, you evaluate it on um, some benchmark, and this gives you some insights. So you, in, in the best case, you learn new things about your hypothesis and you use this insights to improve your model and then you can start over again to train your model. And the faster you can iterate in the cycle, the better you get. So what I do a lot with my teams, I spend a lot of time to make the cycle as frictionless as possible so that you can really quickly and well evaluate any hypothesis you have. And this gives you like the feedback, okay, is, is the model better? Is your hypothesis correct or is it incorrect? <clears throat> and the purpose of a best benchmark is basically to tell you what is the best model to solve a given task. Sounds pretty easy. And I think a lot of people think it's pretty easy, but creating benchmarks and testing model is extremely complicated. I find it more complicated, more complex than actually training model and improving models. <clears throat> so how does academia work in machine learning? So a really popular way for machine learning for PhD is you start with a popular benchmark. So for example, in text, you select the Cornell 2003 named entity recognition benchmark. When you work in computer vision, maybe people still use MNIST or you use Cypher or ImageNet. Then you check what is the state of the art. Let's say it's 94.6. <clears throat> and then you uh, run your experiments. So you, you always check, did you improve on your benchmark? If you did not improve, you run the next experiment, the next experiment. And uh, people got like really, have like really good ways how to run these experiments. So often you can run thousands, 10 of thousands experiments in a really short time. 
And then at some point you find an improved performance. So for example, on this benchmark, you get 94.7 with some tweak to your, to your model. And you're really happy, you publish a paper, you mark your system in bold numbers so that everyone sees 94.7 is better than 90.46. And you say it's state of the art and everyone is sharing you because you found a new better system, how to do named entity recognition or image classification. And that's pretty much how a big fraction of machine learning research works. And I think this also for the people who are not in academia really relevant to know, if you hire people uh, from the university who have maybe a PhD, that they come from this background to find some benchmark, uh, to run a lot of experiments, to find like an improved, until they find some improvement, and then they are happy with the results. What I wanted to show today <clears throat> is that the process of finding better models is a lot more complex and more challenging. And sadly, we have a lot of bad research, and also we have really a lot of bad data science in companies and in startups, which produces a lot of harm uh, to science, to companies, to startups. <coughs> so imagine, uh, <clears throat> so there's a really nice XKCD comic about significant testing. So some researchers are tasked to check if jelly beans cause acne um, <clears throat> they first tested with acne, but it does not cause, uh, uh, they first tested with like in general jelly beans, but it did not cause acne. So then they have the hypothesis, okay, maybe just a certain color of jelly beans is connected to acne. So the first test with their method, if the purple jelly bean is connected to acne, which is not the case, then they test the brown jelly beans, which is also not connected to acne, and they test the pink uh, jelly beans, which is also not connected to acne, then they go on with the silver and the black and the white and the yellow and so on, until at some point they get positive results that green jelly beans are linked to acne with like 95% confidence. And this is like covered up with um, in the news and they write a paper how green jelly beans linked to acne and scientists proved this with like really high confidence. This is of course really, really, I hope it's obvious that this is like not a good scientific practice to test the colors until you find a color that is connected to acne. Um, this is like just like a satirical comic, but actually there's a lot of research which happens in this way, which is published in this way and where um, news agencies like and media and TV outlets are getting this this the, the the scientific publication, broadening it to or bringing it to larger audiences, and also where peer review and journals are accepting this this these false hypotheses. So, what we are concerned with are false positives and um, how are false positives connected to a popularity of a field. So imagine you have like two different fields. You have a really popular field or maybe a benchmark where you have like a lot of papers and a rather unpopular niche field or benchmark where you have few papers. And now the questions to the audience, uh, which of the two has the higher scientific quality so where fewer research results are wrong? So maybe someone from the audience is brave enough to unmute and tell what you think. So where's the scientific quality higher in the popular field or in the unpopular field? Maybe Toby can make an estimated guess. Yeah, well, I, I go with the unpopular field then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you typically you would expect that the popular field is has like a higher scientific quality because I mean so many people work there you have so many experts in it, but actually as I will show in the next slides this leads to actually more wrong research results. They have also been really popular work from two thousand four uh, five, um, claiming most research results are wrong, um, which they showed it in the medicine sector. And I call it the curse of popularity. So the more popular a field or benchmark, so in machine learning, we're really focused on benchmarks. 
Uh, so the more popular the benchmark is, the less relevant the results. So don't assume that, okay, this benchmark is used by so many people. So ImageNet is used by 10,000s of groups. So the results must be really good, be really tested. Actually, it's the opposite. The, the results will be, or most of the findings will be wrong. So to explain this a bit further, as said, we have always these confidence intervals and in 1928, a person arbitrarily chose that a significant threshold of below 5% is acceptable. So we uh, accept a hypothesis if the significance um, value is below 5%. So what you would think about if there are like 100 papers published that out of these 100 papers, five papers would be like wrong. Um, like false positives. So they claim some insights, some connections, some cause, causality. And 95% or 95, per, uh, 95 of these 100 papers would be correct. So that would, what's your guess would be from this 5% significance threshold. Sadly, the reality is a bit, um, bit different. So, um, so assume you have like 1000 hypotheses which are tested in parallel. So this is not connected to machine learning. It addresses any, any uh, science field, medicine, physics, biomedicine, psychology. So you have 1000 physics hypotheses you want to test and these are tested in parallel by different groups. And let's assume that 10% of these hypotheses are true. So they, they are actually, uh, there is some causality in machine learning, they improve the model. And we can identify them in 80% of the cases. So our tests, our benchmarks, they are not perfect. Um, so in four out of five cases, we can identify these hypotheses as correct. This is also known as a statistical power of a test. And then we do significance testing with a threshold of 5%. So what we have is now four different um, cases. So the first one is that the hypothesis is true. So there is some connection, causal collect connection in the world. And our significance test is also true. This is like for 80. So it's 100, 100 of the hypotheses are true. And we have a statistical power of 80%. So 80 of the hypotheses which were tested, we were able to identify that they are actually true. What can happen? So what we also have is we, we tested 900 um, hypotheses, which are not true. And in 5% of the cases, our significance test fails. So we will get like 45 results where we think, okay, this is true. There's a, some causality because our significance test tells there's a causality. And in research, we are extremely focused on positive results. So if you look at, most fields and most conferences or journals, most of the papers report positive results. We found this, we found this in terms of cancer research, we found this in terms of psychology, or we found this in terms of machine learning. So most papers will be presented from this, this, um, from this section, from this column where the significance test told us, okay, there's a connection. So if we look at the numbers, So if we look at the numbers, uh, <clears throat> we know that 45 of the papers of the overall papers will be wrong. So overall, one third, over one third of the papers will have wrong scientific results. So the number is a lot higher than the 5% we would have estimated from the significant test at 5%. <clears throat> Also, um, as mentioned, the more popular field gets and the older field gets or benchmark gets, um, the harder it's to find new significant insights. So major breakthroughs are usually found early. So someone established some research fields and then in the first, in the first lifetime of the research field, we see many big major breakthroughs because they are really hard, uh, really easy to find. <clears throat> And then the older the field gets, the more and more experiments are done. And if you assume that only 1% of the two hypotheses are left, 
and the field got really popular. So now not only like 1,000 groups are working on the field, but 10,000 groups are working on the fields. And we run the same number as before. We see that 86% of the published papers are wrong. So the big majority of the published papers in this really old popular field or benchmark are actually wrong. <clears throat> um, the conclusions the authors make do not hold true. So this is just math. Um, there is a lot of work on reproducibility in any, I think in any scientific field. So for example, in there's like really well-known reproducibility study in cancer science where um, a group tested 53 landmark studies. So this is not like some tiny study, but really important studies where they work closely together with the original authors. And they try to reproduce these studies. So they try to reproduce the understanding of cancer. How does cancer develop? And their result was that only six were reproducible. So 47 of them were not reproducible. They might be wrong, but there's a high probability that these are wrong. So as you see, like of these 50 papers, only like a really, really tiny fraction is likely to be true. Most of them are wrong. Um, this is also connected to, to machine learning. We have the same issue in machine learning. So every few years um, when some technology gets really popular in machine learning, currently transformer networks are really popular in machine learning. Um, people do a lot of experiments. They publish a lot of papers, how you can improve the architecture, how you can improve the machine learning model. And there was a paper which tested it for transformer networks. And they found that most published modifications do not improve the performance. So even such that the paper all claim they make the transformer network so much better and it was published in high impact journals and conferences. If reproduced, they could not find any, well, in, in most cases, not the, they could not reproduce the original claims of the authors. So most of the published papers um, are actually wrong. So if you look at the predictive power of a benchmark, so the predictive power of a benchmark is, um, can you tell from the benchmark what is the better system? So usually in machine learning means you get some higher score on the, uh, on the benchmark, so you conclude your system is better. And people think that this is static, so that if you have a good benchmark, like, I don't know, ImageNet, which is 10 years old, or MNIST, I don't know how many decades that's, that is old, they still think this is a good benchmark with a lot of predictive power, I can still do my test on it. But actually, this is not the case. So what we see that shortly after benchmark is introduced, we start with some good predictive power. So better systems on the benchmark mean these systems are better. And also the papers which claim we found some improvements, uh, they, the, the claims typically hold true. But what we see over time is that the predictive power of the benchmark drops. So and at some point, we have no predictive power left. So you <clears throat> run, you, you test your model on this benchmark and maybe you get an improvement, but this has like absolutely no meaning as your, if your model is actually better on the task or not. So the, the benchmark at some point is completely useless. Um, sadly, it's really hard to estimate when a benchmark gets useless. Um, this depends on a lot of factors. How popular is it? How many experiments have been done? How difficult is the task? How good is the benchmark? But any benchmark has like an end of life time where it will not be any suitable for any experiments anymore. And still we see many popular benchmarks in natural language pro processing, which has like zero or low predictive power. So this is my personal claim where I do not have like any backup proof for this. Uh, but we see a lot of papers on the Connor 2003 or the GLUE or SDS or MSMAP or SuperGLUE benchmark. So we still see every year at the journals and conferences, a lot of papers claiming, okay, we got a new state of the art on these benchmarks. 
and reviews accepted and people use it and, and cite it even such that the benchmarks are so bad and are no longer valid to, to make any claims anymore. So why do benchmarks lose their predictive power? Um, as mentioned, most impactful insights are discovered early. So um, we, we start with a problem, we design some benchmark for it, and then the, the big impactful, easy insights are found quickly and are published quickly. And then it's getting harder and harder to find any further insights. Also over time, the number of experiments um, increase. So maybe when you run like 1,000 experiments a year, after one year, you have 1,000 experiments. After five years, you have 5,000 experiments. After 10 years, you have 10,000 experiments. And as mentioned, the more experiments you run, the more likely is that you'll find false positives. Also, we have a change of language. So in, in language, the, our language changes. Um, you can also call it data drift. So for example, still people use often the Connell 2003 uh, named entity recognition data uh, benchmark where the task is to find named entities. However, this benchmark uses Wall Street Journal articles from the 80s and 90s. And okay, it's only a state-of-the-art entity recognition system for Wall Street Journal articles from the 80s. If you run it on 2022 data, like 40 years later, um, it has like no, no predictive power how well the model will perform, but still companies advertise it, authors publish it and share it and, and cite it um, and claim that this is like a big contribution, even such it has no correlation to most use cases where you want to use it on up-to-date data. Also, our systems are getting better and better in machine learning. And at some point, systems are just too good. So, um, so, so for bad systems, the benchmark works well, but at some point, the systems are so good. And one issue is that benchmarks often treat the world as black and white. So for example, if you do sentiment prediction, uh, you can just label it as positive or negative sentiment. But however, all tasks are ambique. Um, so independent in which domain you go, if you have like image classification and you want to say if it's a cat or a dog, um, also there are MB cases. So what, what's with a cat, which has like the, the dress, the costume of a dog, should you classify it as a cat or as a dog? What's quite important is to know the human upper bounds. So how well do human perform? And once the systems are close to the human upper bound, it does not make sense to go any further or to use this benchmark any further, because this is just fitting to annotation bias and errors. So we see it in a lot of popular benchmark like ImageNet, for example, where the labels, the systems, or where the labels the system improve are actually errors where humans will not agree to assign this label uh, to the given image. And also many measures are imperfect. Um, so for example, in machine translation, we evaluate the quality of machine translation by checking the word overlap between the machine translated text and the, um, the reference text from a professional translator. And this measure works to distinguish between bad and good systems. However, it cannot distinguish between two really good systems. So, so at some point, the systems are too good and the measure cannot predict anymore which system is better. So even if the score is higher you compute, it does not mean that the system is actually better. So this is first about issues with, with benchmarks. Um, the more fundamental issue, which is ask a lot less in science or a lot more seldom in science is do we chase the right benchmarks? So maybe we have a good benchmark with a lot of predictive power. Um, it doesn't matter if you chase this benchmark, if you try to improve on this benchmark, if it's the wrong benchmark. And here I want to present like two real world examples. So the first one is on text embedding. So that's also where uh, they approached me. So, so I wrote an artic article about criticizing the OpenAI GPT-3 text embeddings and where I was invited here to give the talk today. 
Um, so in January this year, OpenAI published a GPT-3 embedding endpoint with a lot of PR claiming new state-of-the-art results, impressive semantic search capabilities, a lot of buzz on Twitter and LinkedIn with their big marketing and PR department. So for the people who do not know what are embeddings, so embeddings are useful for many tasks. Um, you can use them for semantic search. Um, so this is also my, my main expertise in terms of research. You can use them for clustering. So if you have like a lot of customer feedback and you want to find what do customers like about the product and dislike about the product, um, you can use that if you want to do deduplication, if you have a large text collection and you want to deduplicate it or image collection, you can use them. And typically they are mapped to a dense vector space and then you can do operations in this vector space using, for example, for clustering, some, some clustering, k-means clusterings, for example. And so in general, OpenAI published this GPT-3 embedding endpoint with a lot of buzz and preface, impressive semantic search capabilities. And I was a bit skeptical. So at first I was really motivated to learn more how good are these. So I tested them a bit more careful on better benchmarks. So what OpenAI did in the paper, they tested the embedding endpoint on SendEvol. So a SendEvol is a rather old benchmark from a colleague of mine. And here they said, okay, we get um, new state of the art. So previous model was at 90, we are at 92, put it in like big bold numbers, claim, okay, this is like really impressive results. However, SendEval is like a rather, yeah, rather narrow benchmark, which I do not really like um, because it addresses a really tiny use case for embeddings where you want to run classification, a lot of classification um, with a lot of different classifiers on the same data. So you have this use case, for example, at Facebook where the benchmark was um, developed that they run hundreds, thousands of text classifiers on the same, on, on, a, on a single post for a lot of different purposes. However, the benchmark, it's absolutely not suitable for more common tasks like search or clustering, which is a lot more popular and interesting when you use vector spaces. And also most recent papers start to ignore the benchmark. So I personally also completely ignore this benchmark. So this makes it, of course, a lot easier to achieve state of the art if no one else in the state of the art race is using this benchmark anymore. So I wanted to test the embeddings from OpenAI on a proper benchmark, which tests a lot more use cases in a lot of more domains. So I tested the embeddings from OpenAI on 14 different tasks with like really diverse domains and, and settings. And actually what we see is that the performance is really, really bad. So the largest model was like 175 billion parameters. It's actually worse, a lot worse than models from 2018, like four year olds from, from Google, the universal sentence encoder. And also in terms of cost, we see quite a big difference. So if you run the biggest model and you encode 1 million documents, you get an invoice from OpenAI about $60,000. If you do the same with like an open free model uh, on Google Cloud, you get like 10, 10 cents as an invoice. So they, they have on the benchmarks really good performance. They did a lot of marketing, but if you do actually proper evaluation, the models are really bad and extremely expensive. Different application which they advertise a search. Um, so here on search, it works a lot better where they said, okay, we achieve a new state of the art, which they also put in bold numbers and make it really, really impressive. However, the improvement is just like 0.1. So the model from them is like 52.8. The previous model, which they also included in, in their benchmark state of the art model, is 0.7. And for this 0.1 improvement, you have like actually 400,000 times higher costs. So if you want to do search on Wikipedia and you use OpenAI, you spend like over a million to get a search function over Wikipedia. Why, when you use this model, you spend just $3. You have 
3000 times higher latency. So in search, we not only care about search quality, but I don't want to wait five seconds, 10 seconds, a minute to get my search results. I want to have it instantly, like in 10 milliseconds. And also the service server, you need to run the search, you need to be 20 times higher. So the cost to run the search is also 20 high, times higher in terms of infrastructure you need there. Um, so, but this was like not considered at all by OpenAI in their paper. They were just chasing this benchmark without any consideration about costs, about uh, latency, about memory you need to run these operations. Another example, which is a lot higher, um, or has a lot higher impact is from Silos. So Silos is a company in the US um, they started, so, so it's, it's similar to Immoscout in Germany. So you can put up your properties in the US, your houses uh, for selling. And what they created quite early on in the uh, history of the company, company is a Sestimate. So that's just a branded name for Estimate. And you can enter your address and then they tell you what's the selling price for your house. So if you want to sell your house today, this is the price you can expect. And over the years, the um, error got really good. So, so they measured it. What did they estimate? What's the final price it was sold for? And over the year, they made a lot of progress. And the median absolute error is below 5% of the final sale price. So in 50% of the cases, uh, the final sale price is within 5% of what they have predicted, which is really impressive. So the company came up with the idea of house flipping. So selling a house is a really slow and annoying process. So you have to put up the, the advertisement. A lot of people come to you, talk to you, see your house, see your personal things in the house. You have to do negotiation with them. So they thought, OK, this is an annoying process. And when process is annoying, there's an opportunity to, to provide value and to make money. So they had the idea to have house flipping. So you enter the address on the website, you fill in the form, and then you get an offer from Silo, say, okay, your house that we estimate at $500,000. And then you can say, okay, that's good offer. I will sell to Silo. And you have no hassle with any prospective buyers coming to your house and watching your house and inspecting your house. And then Silo will renovate the house and then will sell the house again with a pro as, at a profit. And what was critical for Silo is that they don't buy too expensive. So as you can imagine, anyone interested in real estate, um, you have to buy at a low price and to have to sell at a higher price to make a profit. And not so long ago, like I don't know, last month, two months ago, um, it was reported that Zillow lost like nearly a billion dollars in 2021 on this business, mainly due to bad model evaluation. So they had to lay off 25% of the workforce. The uh, stock market, the stock value dropped by, I don't know, 10 billions of dollars. So this is like really, really major impact. And they claim it on bad model evaluation. So to understand why, why it failed, um, you, you have to see what happened or what, what has been leading to this. So they did not do the strategy like out of the blue, uh, just, okay, we, we do, the, do the strategy, we buy a lot of houses and try to flip them, but they actually carefully tested it. So they run a lot of back tests with the historical data they had until the early 2000s with a lot of different markets. And then they also tested it, the strategy over three years and actually buying really houses and selling houses. So in, as you see in 2019 and 2020, they bought few houses and then they got quite good results in 2019 and 2020 so that they said, okay, this is really major profit driver for our company. So in 2021, they started to buy a lot of houses. But it, as it turned out, this was like a really bad, bad decision. And they had to sell most of the houses at, at a loss. The issue was that in 2019 and 2020, we had like a really strong bull market in the US for houses. So the price increased quite a lot. 
And losing money in a bull market is really hard. Um, I mean, so maybe you pay 10% too much for the house, but if the house price increases by 25%, you still make a nice profit. However, if you have like a beer market or a beer market or site market where the prices for houses does not increase but stay stable, and if you then pay 10% too much for the house, um, you make at the end quite a big loss. So, and this happened in 2021, the housing market in the US cooled down. The model was not able to react to this and the strategy no longer worked, which led to like over 800 million of a loss for the company. Also, as mentioned, it was bad model evaluation. So, the, so, so if you buy and sell houses, you have an adversarial market. So on average, the price predictions were correct. So as mentioned, the median error was within 5%. However, the people who sell to Zillow is not the average. So in the house market, you have hidden gems. So your house is really great, um, perfect view, really nice view on, on, I don't know, on a lake or some mountains. And then you estimate the price um, on the Zillow website, you get some value, 500,000, but you know, okay, this is far too low because it does not address this unique property of your house. So you don't sell it to, to Zillow um, because you know on the market, you will get a much higher price. And then there are some houses which have an issue. So if you go there, they have some bad smell or some noise or some plumbing issue. And an algorithm on the website where you just enter the address cannot tell this, it cannot tell is there like really bad smell and a bad smell negatively affects uh, the, the price you can achieve from a, from a buyer. So this is not reflected by this estimate from Zillow. So the, the, what Zillow is offering you is much higher than the market value. And of course you're not stupid. So Zillow, Zillow is uh, giving you a lot of money for your shitty house of course you will sell to Zillow. So they were missing on all these hidden gems on all these really good properties and they were buying all these bad properties all these bad houses which has some issue um, which were not reflected by their algorithm. Okay, for the final part of the talk, I want to talk about how to design better benchmarks. Um, so for me personally, the quality um, of a benchmark is extremely important. So it's a key component to make progress. Um, sadly, this is often not seen by many people. So they spend like really little time on the benchmark and try to more to iterate on the models and do hyperparameter tuning. Um, but I would advise for anyone in research, for anyone in a data science team at a large company, for anyone in a startup, spend a large fraction of your time on the designing the benchmark. And for me personally, designing a benchmark is more challenging than improving models. So we spend often a lot of time, like half a year, one year to come up with like really good benchmarks because we iterate so many times about over the benchmark, is it really measuring what we want? How can we improve it? What are bottlenecks and blind spots um, in this benchmark? And also a common observation I see in data science teams in large companies, you often have like a business team, which tells the data science team, hey, here's our Excel file as input. We have columns A to D and the label is column E. Now please uh, build us a model with like 80% accuracy. And then the data science team thinks, great, let's start. We measure accuracy. We take the columns from the business team. We try to predict the column they told us. And here's the, the, the model, the, 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 the final model and the final prediction. And this is sadly so wrong on so many levels, um, but it's, it's a really, really, really common process at any large company I've worked with. And I have to push really hard uh, the data science team to go back to the business team and to talk to the business team to understand the problem and how to design a better benchmark. So, What's missing here is first, you have to understand what's the intended use case. So how will the model be used? Um, do we, will we predict some label? Are we ranking some results? Will it be fully automated or semi-automated? 
So really understand perfectly how will the users at the end use the system. Also, what are the costs of errors? So in research, we often treat all errors with equal costs. So if we have some spam classifier and we classify an email as spam or ham, we, we don't care about the cost. We say, okay, that's equal cost. cost. However, in any production setting, this is seldom the case. So in most cases, there's a strong preference for the one case or the other for false positives or false negatives. And you need to adapt your benchmarks to reflect this. Also, one thing which is missing in so many cases is what's the human upper bound. So how good are humans in this task? So the business team, they don't have this information because they are not data scientists. Uh, the data science team, the answer I often get is they cannot estimate it because they don't understand the, the task. They don't understand what the business team wants to do. And also they don't want to ask the business team because the connection points are really seldom. They maybe just see them once a month and they don't have that much time. However, understanding what's the human upper bound is extremely critical to see if you hit the limit and also to improve your data. So when we are creating data sets, we spend many, many cycles to improve the human agreement to see what are the MB cases, where does it come from? How can we make it more clear in terms of the description, in terms of the labels, in terms of the annotation process? And also don't forget what else is important. So do you care about inference speed? Do you care about robustness, um, memory size, and so on? So this is, can also be often quite critical, um, which you can only infer from when you understand the use case. Also, benchmark must evolve. So this is a common issue I see in many cases. People create like some benchmark at one point, and then they intend to use it over the next five years or 10 years. But as models evolve, our benchmarks must, must also evolve. So you. If you run some machine learning company, uh, let's say you, you run Google search, you need to have a dedicated team which is improving constantly the benchmark, how you test your models. And also please stop, please stop using outdated benchmarks. So if a benchmark is too old and have been too popular, please don't run your experiments on it. It will tell you nothing about the results. Also, it makes sense to restrict the number of submissions. So an issue is that often the test set is available and then the data science team will take, take a hypothesis, run it on the dev set, do some tuning, and then do it on a test set. But as mentioned, the more experiments we run on a benchmark, the less likely we can trust the numbers. Hence, it's a good solution to restrict, really strongly restrict the number of evaluations you can do on the test set. So for example, maybe the data science team can only submit the model once per month to the production team. And the production team then runs the test on a secret hidden test set and will only report back to the model development team. Yeah, this, this is a prom promising um, model which we want to deploy to, to production. Also have a dev set for model development. So the data science or model development team can use it as they like but really keep away the test set from them. And if possible, use an out of domain test data set. So if you do, I don't know, you, you do name entity recognition, you have training data on, on, on news articles and then, but later you want to do it on tweets. So your training data and your dev data should be just the news articles and the secret hidden test data set should be tweets to see, does it generalize well to a different domain? Also, if possible, use a temporal split. Um, so this is, works quite well. So your test data should be the most recent. Um, so the up-to-date data you're interested in, and then your train data and your development data can be the oldest. What also works well is to have diversity, to not only test on a single task or a single domain, so if you want to have this applied in a really broad domain, um, really test it in, in many settings. So if you, if I don't know, Google develops a new search algorithm, they not only test it on English, but they, but they test it on a lot of different languages and markets and so on. 
and see if it works in all these domains. And look for biases. So this is often overlooked. Um, so what does what biases does your data set have? So every data set has some bias in the one way or the other. So it's really important to know what is the bias in terms of, of, of the data set. So for example, for a lot of search data sets, we have a bias uh, for lexical match that text which have a high lexical overlap is persuasive annotated as a higher relevancy. And this influences how model develops. So because they, they are restricted by this bias. Also what bias does your benchmark has? So for example, in NLP with BERT, um, the GLUE benchmark became really popular. However, it has a limitation that it's only mainly sentence task. Seven out of eight of these tasks are sentence pairs. And transformer networks are really strong on these tasks. So transformer networks are perfectly made for the GLUE benchmark. If the GLUE benchmark, which have been a bit more diverse, more use a more diverse task and more diverse task and not only sentence pair task, but also single text task, we might have seen like a different story. So maybe transformer networks would not have become that popular. And maybe today people would share about CNN networks in NLP. And there's a really interesting paper on this called the Benchmark Lottery, which um, addresses this in a more detail. So how does benchmark influence the development we see? So the GLUE benchmark made a really strong influence that we now will see where everyone will use transformer networks and not CNN networks because transformer networks are so much better on sentence pair tasks. But our single text pair, uh, single text task CNN networks are really strong and, and comparative to transformer networks. Okay, so what should you get out of this talk? Um, please think about more about your benchmarks, independent of your role. If you're in a startup, in a big data science team in academia, think about benchmark. Is the benchmark still good? And is the benchmark actually testing what you're interested in or the field is interesting in? In so many cases, the benchmark is not testing what the you or the field is interested in. Most research findings are irrelevant due to bad benchmarks because they are not testing it what the field is really interested in or the predictive power uh, vanished for the benchmark. And so always ask yourself, is it still a good benchmark? Can I still use it? And what we need more is evolving benchmarks. So especially in academia, our benchmarks must get better over time. So we need constantly to improve our benchmarks. But also if you work in some company, um, don't assume you can use the same benchmark for your product over the next five years. It must be constantly improved as the same as your model improves. That's so much from my side. Uh, really looking forward to questions you might have. Yeah, thanks, Niels. That was really insightful. I have a ton full of questions, but I think we first <laughs> asked the audience. And then it, it, if you have some more time, the, the um, conference was actually scheduled until 6. So um, if you have some time, then we can yeah. surely stay a bit longer. Anyone from the audience, you can either. Yeah, there's somebody over the Hannes. Hi, yeah, Niels, thanks so much for your um, for your presentation. That was really, really helpful, uh, especially the last part I really liked about um, the basically like quality of how to how to design that benchmarks. I had one question, though, concerning the first part, which related, if I understood you correctly, a little bit uh, to the concept of correction for multiple comparison. So like whenever you test something, then you'll find uh, something something that is uh, something that's a positive result, but it might not be true. And so my background is in, in neuroscience and neuroimaging. And people do a lot of, uh, they, they apply a lot of procedures in order to correct for this. One could be a really conservative one is Bonferroni. Just divide the, your confidence level or the 5% by the number of tests you run. So would you say that's actually something that's applicable here too? So whenever I write a paper, I just look in the literature or oh, they like 20 papers on this. So basically my significance level is yet now somewhere else. Yeah. 
Um, yes, yeah, so, so there are many issues here. So one is like the 5%, I personally find it like too high. So I personally always recommend to look at significance tests, which are a lot lower, but this does not solve it fully yet. So there was like in physics, there have been study on a penta quarks, quarks which consist of like five pieces instead of three pieces. And a group were able to show this with like a really, really low significance value, like one in a billion probability that this is a chance. And then a lot of other groups were able to reproduce it. But this was actually false res results. Because if you look for the positive, if you're as a researcher want to find this special quarks, which have like five components, you will find ways how to interpret the data, which is also known as p-hacking. And then if others also see, okay, there, there's some results. Um, we, we, uh, there, there's a result and we want to reproduce this study. We'll also try to find ways how to, how to confirm this results. Um, so what became popular in certain fields is uh, pre-registering of experiments. So you say, okay, I have this hypothesis. I don't know, eating dark chocolate can help to reduce body weight. And so this is also an actual example where people found a, a causality here. So you, you first say, okay, this is my hypothesis. This is the test I want to run. This is reviewed by an independent committee where they say, okay, this is acceptable. This is a good scientific test. And then you run the experiment and independent of the results, you report them. So if they are positive, you report them, okay, dark chocolate helps to reduce body weight. Or if it's not the case, you say, okay, we, we tested this, uh, but there was no connection here. So this is actually uh, quite helpful in a lot of fields like medicine and psychology um, to have these pre-registration of experiments. In machine learning, it's a bit harder because we have such an iterative evolutionary process where we test a lot of hypotheses and see what works at the end. So, so I can just recommend um, to, to peep away the test sets and in the best case, people test it, which are independent of the model, people who create the model because then you have like different incentives. So people developing the model have the incentive to show that it works. And if you have an independent group which does the test, they don't care if it works or not. So they will just slam it in your face and say, no, it didn't work on our secret test set. Thank you. All right. And um, sorry for the confusing name. Uh, we are a big group in a, in a room, and so uh, we just share one screen. So my name is Johannes. I'm, I'm working at uh, Morantix Labs as a researcher. And I'm super curious about like the your take on the recent trend, especially in the NLP community, and but also foundation models, where people start averaging benchmarks. So they report <laughs> averages of averages on benchmarks. And I'm not sure what I should think about this because I have the feeling that there is like some hidden statistics for, or a statistics law that tells you like if you just average over benchmarks, you will get a power law or something like this. But yeah. I would be curious about your, your take on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, th this is really common. So, so you test on 10 different tasks, you get results, and then you do the average over this, often like using different measures on the one accuracy, on the other F1, and on the third one, maybe blue score. This is hugely problematic uh, to do so. Um, so, so often, like if you do use different measures, they are not comparable. And also the range plays a big role. So if you have one data set, which has like really strong models, so where you have like 99% accuracy, the difference here will be like really low. And then you have another data set where you have like 10% accuracy. So here you can make quite big improvements. So at the end, only this second data set plays a role where you have like really low numbers and where you can make a big improvement. On the first data set where you have like, I don't know, a score of 90, it will not matter at the end for the average. I'm also guilty to average over average when proposing benchmarks. Um, because it's really hard to compare models when you have like one model with 10 results, the other model with 10 results. 
to tell which model is better. And also if you want to put it in like some paper structure where you say, okay, previously the average was 50%, now we're at 55%. Um, so, so we discussed it over and over again over the years, but we did not yet find a better solution how you can compare models across many data sets. Um, if you're not in an academic setting and you do it in a production or in a company setting, um, you can look a lot more into the details. So where does, does the improvement come from? Is it just from a single data set? So maybe uh, the new model is, has the same performance or a bit weaker performance on not nine data sets, but on this 10th data set, got like a really big improvement. And then you need to evaluate on this data set, like, okay, is it like really relevant? Maybe the data set is like really bad. Um, so here we have a lot more random noise, which leads to the improvement. So I personally look more at the individual results and try to conclude from there. <clears throat> but yeah, for papers, it's hard. You need some numbers so that people can compare and be happy and publish that they got the new state of the art. Right, and we have David. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much for, for your talk, Nils. My name is David. I'm the one of the co-founders of Istari AI. Um, I was especially wondering in the context of your talk, um, how would you view behavioral testing or how would you integrate behavioral testing to maybe produce better benchmarks? Or do you guys use behavioral testing or in what, what settings and in which use case do you guys use behavioral setting, uh, behavioral testing? Can you explain a bit more what you mean with behavioral testing? Mm -hmm. So for example, um, we have one model which um, reads text from company websites and decides whether this text reflects AI know-how or not. Yeah. And we, we, of course, we have a data set which we create for this case, um, but we also wanted to test like the general the general behavior of the model. And then we uh, input sentence like this company, or we have AI know-how or none of our employees has AI know-how. Okay. And this is what I would see as behavioral test in this case. Okay, so yeah, I, I know this also under adversarial testing where you mm -hmm. try to, to modify. Um, yes, so far in my work, we did not really use it that much. Um, there the question is like always how much is it connected to actual real text because um, you can always create this these artificial texts um, which uh, fools the model um, I think behavioral testing can be interesting if you're in an adversarial setting so if you're gmail and you want to filter out spam <laughs> And people will try to, to create like spam, like this is a spam email or this is not a spam email. There I think behavioral testing is extremely critical. If you don't have this adversarial setting, um, it's interesting to do, but I often find like the solutions quite hard to, to conclude because for every model, I mean, every model is imperfect and for every model you find some some issues and then it's hard to compare, okay, model A has this issue, model B has this issue. So what should you conclude at the end? So I more like the business case where you say, okay, this, these are actual business examples um, and there you test it. But of course, when you demo a model to a customer, the customer inputs like simple examples, like, okay, exactly. we do not have AI knowledge and your model predicts, okay, amazing company. <laughs> This is quite embarrassing when it fails on these bad cases. So it's it's often to have it like on a on a like as a like kind of a unit test that it does not fail on these basic examples. All right. Yeah. Thank you for uh, detailing your thoughts on this. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. We have Ahmed. Wow. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question regarding uh, like benchmarks for semantic search. Let's say uh, be from your team, and uh, the question is: Does it make more sense to build a model that works for such benchmark, even if your model is supposed to work only for one case, like biomedical search? Because 
um, sometimes it is easier to build like a search model that works better for uh, for this specific field than build it to work for multiple fields uh, and out of domain um yeah that that's a great question where i don't have like a perfect answer to it um in general i would be if, if a model works only for a really narrow use case for a really narrow domain i would be a bit afraid of the model that it, it's a bit um bit to op over optimize too much overfitted on this narrow use case so you would ask like okay why does it not perform well on a more broader setting um so i would if possible always test it also in a bit broader setting so does it make sense does it work also in other scenarios as a fail case so for example if you do a sentiment classification and you want just to do sentiment classification on tweets maybe your main benchmark is the performance of sentiment on tweets but you can also as a fail safe test it on news articles movie reviews product reviews and if you observe okay this model is like really good on tweets but really bad on movie reviews and product reviews in terms of sentiment um, this would should be like a red flag where you need to to see maybe it overfitted to your benchmark um, and then you can investigate okay is it actually like a really good model or is it just overfitted on the specific benchmark you try to optimize for? Okay, thank you. And there's Emira. Yeah. Hi, Nils. Very nice talk. Thank you very much for the insights that you shared with us. Um, I have a question. How can we make benchmark designing kind of more attractive for academia? <laughs> so I have to admit people in my group, I mean, I come rather from the PL community, so from these less popular areas, and uh, but nevertheless benchmarks or software engineering benchmarks are very important for us too. So people in my group are uh, set up to, to design a benchmark for testing the quality of, let's say, vulnerability detection tools. And I have to say, while I agree that this is a very valuable thing to do, I'm a bit concerned uh, what that would mean for their um, dissertation, right? Because you said it, it takes a long time. It's hard to, when you write a paper about it, it's hard probably to argue for claims about the benchmarks or how do we test the benchmarks themselves, right? Um, so what do you think? Is there any hope that in academia, this benchmark design will become more popular? Of course, if you get one right, then you get a lot of, a big chance to be, cited a lot and yeah. to, to create impact but it takes a lot of time and effort and the outcome is kind of not yeah. easy to, to measure or to, to be sure it will be some good outcome I, and I the other it. thing is i mean related a little bit to this is kind of how we can get away from this publishing culture of i got 0 0.1 percent more accuracy uh, whatever it takes, right? Whether it takes yeah, millions yeah. of, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so to the first question, how can we make it more attractive? So I made the similar experiences when we, when I proposed or my group proposed new benchmarks. We had like sometimes really hard times with reviewers saying, yeah, this is, I mean, it's just a benchmark. It's just a collection of data sets. So no value here, reject. But they did not see that we spent like, like one year on it, discussing it, improving it, so that we put it to a really high quality. And then at the end, also luckily they, some made like quite nice impact. Um, so first of all, I think we need um, awareness, like in all the body of academia, starting from, I don't know, students to PhD to postdocs, how important are benchmarks? Also to understand that benchmarks are not cannot be established at one time and then use, be used forever, but that benchmarks must evolve. So as our model evolves, that benchmarks must evolve. And that often benchmarks are more critical and more important to a field than any new model, which does like a tiny twist and reporting point one improvement. So I think we need a lot more recognition here. Um, Still, even when we have the recognition, 
I'm not a big fan of creating benchmarks because it's so much work, especially when you annotate data. So, so I don't know how we can ease the pain there. Um, I think it's not, not really possible. So if you want to make big impact with a benchmark, you have to invest a lot of time and money usually. So I think um, recognition is like really important all over the field, like from the student to people reviewing grant applications to not say, okay, this is just a benchmark, but the benchmark is a critical field in a field that is critical to the field and to push forward the development in a field. <clears throat> to your que second question, how can we decrease the incentives to these tiny improvements? Yeah, that's that's a tough question. I know. I know. <laughs> that, that's, I mean, sadly, but... sadly, we have this in our field to say, okay, we, we have state of the art, we make the results bold, we talk about how amazing it is. And then if people report something so positively, we as a reader also get like really positive feeling about it. So even if you're a senior researcher, you get also really positive feeling if they have like really positive work like positively framed um framed framed paper like one way would be to pre-register experiments to say okay i have this hypothesis that's how i motivate it that's how i want to do the experiments and then independent of the outcome i will report it so will it work or will it fail i report it but i think this will not solve it in in machine learning because machine learning, we have a big engineering part and we want to get like better systems. So if, if I design a car, I want a better, faster, more energy efficient car. And I don't care about failed cars, which do not run and do not work and will, will fail apart. So I think that that's a big issue there. Um, so, so what I like is to, to force people to open source, um, their models. So we see a lot of papers claiming big impacts, but then they keep all the code and all the models secret. So you cannot really test it by yourself. You cannot just really um, play around with and see it doesn't make sense or not. And what I saw, so my research is everything is open source and we make it like really easy to access it. And then people will critically evaluate it. So if we bullshit on a paper, um, people will notice because they will apply it to their scenario and it will not work. So it will fail there. And then they will raise issues on GitHub and say, okay, why, why is it so bad? Why does it not work? Um, so, so I think this can help a lot to mm -hmm. encourage and force people to release the code, to release the model so that people can actually test it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my area, we are going to the uh, direction of you submit a paper, but you submit also the code, the experiments, all the artifacts. They are evaluated in the same in parallel with the paper. Yeah. So this is probably a way to go. Yeah. That's really good. Awesome. Is there any any more questions? Uh, Niels already thanks for taking the time and, and also for the audience that there are still so many people. It's like 30 people still <laughs> here listening. So any further questions? If not, I, I think it's you're pretty approachable. I I would assume. Yeah. And I'll hand over my questions um, at the next be around maybe in Darmstadt. Right. Okay. If there's if there's no further questions, then thanks again for joining. Thanks, Niels, and um, have a nice evening.